<laughs> there we go. So welcome Nick Brown. So I was expecting like ten people. Oh <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> um uh, it is be very, very dangerous because I have my laptop so much away from me and I'm going to uh, just give me ten seconds yep. to close down this little window and then I'm gonna pull the laptop up a little bit closer. So while you're doing that, I'll give you an introduction. Okay. So Nick Brown holds an MSc in Applied Positive Psychology from the University of East London and a postgraduate certificate in Existential Coaching from the New School of Psychotherapy and Counseling in London. He's... Cr <laughs> I did my research. <laughs> <laughs> so, also, he's currently working on his PhD in health psychology at the University Medical Center Groningen in the Netherlands. And I love his... I sent my draft dissertation in two weeks ago, so... So he's ABD, all but defended. So his Twitter handle is fantastic. It's personal coach, in person or via Skype, specializing in dilemmas. PhD candidate UMC Groningen and a self-appointed data police cadet. <laughs> My favorite part, British and Irish amazingly. <laughs> so, if anyone watched Twitter the other day, I called him a griffin. Does anybody know that $300,000 statue that's on the corner of Gordon and Stone Road, the griffin? What is he sitting on? Do you know why he's sitting on a book? What is the what is a griffin? Does anyone know? What's that? It's a, that's the animals it's made up of. But do you know the mythological meaning of a griffin? What it, what its purpose was? You, okay, how many of you guys have a tattoo of a griffin? I don't believe none of you have one. <laughs> if anyone here gets a tattoo of a griffin without knowing what it is, shame on you. A griffin is a guardian of knowledge. That's the whole purpose of why it's our mascot. So, Nick Brown is a guardian of knowledge. Once academics, academics publish in an area, we need someone to police to make sure that academic integrity has been upheld. So we're going to talk first. Nick, can you give us two minutes of what your PhD is on? Uh, my, my PhD... Um the working title has been the same for three years, and I really do need to change it before I, I get it all printed. But, um, uh, it's currently entitled Positive Emotions in Health Psychology, colon, Magic Bullet for Wishful Thinking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and um, if, you, uh, if you Google Nick Brown Psychology, well, first of all, if you Google Nick Brown Psychology, you'll have to step over uh, there's a grad student, I think at Rutgers, somewhere in the US anyway, called Nick Brown, he's not me. But if you Google Nick Brown psychology, you'll find all, all sorts of ridiculous things that have been covered by the uh, press since I got into this racket, which is um, seven years ago uh, next week. Wow. And until then, I was, uh, I was a computer guy. I was a computer guy working in a fairly nondescript bureaucratic organization. I got moved to human resources in um, a terrible administrative mix-up, and I thought that psychology could maybe help with um, uh, with some of the issues I was facing, and I kind of discovered it couldn't. And then I got the opportunity to take a paycheck, or take a, a go-away golden handshake check, and uh, so I did that, and then I kind of become a full-time um, critical researcher in psychology. So positive psychology was the, the field that my master's was in, um, but if you, if you Google it, you will find that my, my first ever published article was with a very famous mathematician called Alan Sokal, or mathematician physicist. He's actually not very famous as a mathematician or physicist, but he's extraordinarily famous uh, as, uh, from the, uh, as being a big part of what called the science wars of the 1990s. And I, I just wrote him because I found this article that I thought was ridiculous in the way that he had written about ridiculous stuff. And um, I'm aware that I'm looking at myself with this picture in the corner of my screen. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to slide that across so I can't see that. And then 
I won't be there. Now I'm going to look at the screen, so now I can't see myself, because otherwise I'm looking down there. And um, uh, so I, yeah, I wrote to Alan and spoke to Alan and said, this sounds like the crap you were writing about. I get it. I was nobody. I was on my third weekend of an executive education uh, master's course. And he wrote back. And he said, you know, yeah, you seem to have found something here. And, we, and in the end, he ended up being my co author. So my first ever article was in American Psychologist, which is a pretty substantially good journal, with uh, a guy who didn't know anything about psychology either. And it's kind of just been all, yeah, an assortment of other crazy stuff since then. Wow. So tell us, let's start with the, let's, well, let's first talk. Brian Winsink is a professor, a full professor at University of Cornell with an H index, believe it or not, an H index is the number of papers you've had cited that number of times. Brian Winsink has an H index of 70. That is unheard of. It's remarkable to have an H index that high. What? It's smaller yesterday. Yeah, <laughs> significantly smaller. <laughs> so so you, you're, you found the anomalies in the pizza papers. Yeah, uh, so um, I, I hang around on Twitter with a bunch of, of critical scientists, and what happened was um, Brian Winsink wrote a blog post that he got a lot of flack for, um, partly because of the way it appeared to indicate he ran his lab, and partly because of the way it appeared to indicate how he did his research. And that was about a month or three or four weeks before, before I first saw this. And then somebody just happened to tweet a link to it, and I happened to be on Twitter one day with my um, fellow data police cadets. And we just thought this was amusing. So everyone was talking about you know, how terribly he was running his lab, and we decided to do that. The, um, the kind of secret to what I do is I actually read the paper. <laughs> and the, the first, I'm going to be revealing probably this evening, I don't have a list, but I'm sure they will leak out a number of dirty little secrets about science. And the first thing is almost nobody actually reads all of the article. Um, you read the abstract to decide if you even want to bother downloading the article. Uh, but very few people read the methods and results sections of a scientific article in any great detail. And they certainly aren't really paying attention when they're doing it. And it turns out that that's where all the good stuff is. And also that's where people hide, or try to hide, the, the less good stuff. So tell us about Sprite. Because Sprite's what you use to catch the anomaly, correct? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So um, I can maybe even show it you. So, uh, well, Sprite is what we used to catch them. We didn't use my colleague used it because we only really have Sprite working this year. A colleague of mine came up with the idea, and um, so I don't know how much I don't know how much you guys know about. Let me see how do I share the desktop. Okay. I don't, if, 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 it's like when you transfer a call on your phone. You know, if it goes beep beep beep, I'll call you back. Okay. Um, <laughs> Share screen. Okay. Let's see. Um, so, okay. Can you see a screen? It's coming. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, this is um, Sprite, which is a uh, a horrific acronym. But basically what we do is, uh, so if you imagine you've given people a survey in psychology and you've asked them questions to answer on a scale of 1 to 7, and you have 45 people, and the paper says that the mean was 3.53 and the standard deviation was 1.56, 1, 1. Uh, what might the responses have looked like? So what might the histograms have looked like? Because people don't share their data. And in historical papers, you're not going to get the data anyway. So what Sprite lets you do is it lets you draw a picture of what the distributions might have looked like. And I can, I can ask it for nine at a time, and then I can ask it for nine more. Now, where it gets interesting is there's, there's quite a lot of possibilities there. But if I go down to a smaller standard deviation, then you can see some interesting things happen. Almost nobody can have answered one. Almost nobody can have answered seven. Um, if I go down, I think it's 0.63 in this data. There are only six possibilities. There may be a seven, because it's a, it's a heuristic process. It doesn't find all. 
So when you read that, and you have to look at those at the questions and say, is that a reasonable plan for that mean and standard deviation? If the question is, um, you know, how much do you prefer, I don't know, uh, green M&Ms to red M&Ms, you're going to get a lot of threes and fours, don't really care. If you ask people what they think of Donald Trump, you're not going to have a whole lot of threes and fours. <laughs> and so, depending on the, um, the claims that are made in the article, the description of the, of the survey, sometimes you could say, okay, well, why have we got this pattern of data? Would we expect the data to look like if this was real data? So that's what Sprite kind of lets us do. And Sprite is the idea of a colleague of mine, based on some work we've done together completely manually, he had the idea of automating it, but I'm a better programmer than him. <laughs> so my version is here, and, and it's for public release, and, and his version just comes in that and it's pretty cranky. There you go. So, so in the pizza studies, what was it that drew your attention? How did a set of papers from Cornell, Brian Winnick's lab, on Pizza consumption interest you. Why did that come in front of your desk? Well, it was, as I say, it was, it was because they were linked to from that blog post. So the blog post said that the, the person had got five papers, and in fact, four of them were on that subject. One was on a completely different subject. So we just pulled the papers and started looking. And the first thing we found were an even simpler variety of error, which we call grim errors, which is where you report, for example, that there were seven people and they were asked how many children they had, and the mean was 1.52. <coughs> well, the point is, you can't have an integer divided by 7 and get 1.52. Now, that's intuitively obvious. That's kind of obvious for 3 and 5 and 7 you can kind of do in your head. But it turns out that if you've got a two-digit decimal fraction, uh, and let's say you've got 41 participants, there are 41 valid decimal fractions and 59 that aren't. Wow. And a whole bunch of these reported numbers were just impossible given the sample size. So then we started digging into them, and then we would find that, for example, there were four papers all made from the same data set. Now, you're not meant to do that unless you report that you're doing that. This is a, a, a phenomenon known as salami slicing. But uh, independent <laughs> of that, the papers contradicted each other. So there would be a claim in one paper saying this many people did this, or even the methods that we described contradicted each other. So one of them would say that we interviewed the people when they in the restaurant when they went to pay, and then others would say, no, we did surreptitious looking, and then one of them said we weighed how much food went back to the kitchen, and then the other said, no, we observed it. So clearly, nobody was meant to read all four. Right. They were all in different journals. So were all four retracted then? I think only, I think one or two have been retracted, and the other two have been corrected. Uh, journals aren't very good at retracting articles because it is extremely embarrassing. Because and it indicates that the peer review process... Well, it depends. But in this particular case, the papers were so terrible, you wonder what, you want, you know, you wonder what the reviewers were smoking room. Right. <laughs> so, with... So if, if nobody's familiar with Brian Winnick, he's all over BuzzFeed today. If you go to BuzzFeed, if you go to Science Alerts, he's front page news with, he's now had 13 papers retracted. Six were retracted yesterday. So all of his papers within the JAMA network, I believe now, have been retracted. That's correct, he has seven. So, he had one of the papers retracted twice. Well, no, see, so he's up to 13 now. Yeah. No, but but he's, he's actually had 14 retractions. Oh. Papers got, got retracted twice from the same journal, which we believe is a first in the history of scientific publishing. Wow. Frank Sinatra, Frank Sinatra had a song about it. <laughs> so, what I want to do today, too, is also talk about academic misconduct. And any time there's an opportunity to talk about academic misconduct, I take the opportunity to jump at it. It is an extremely important topic. And I want to point out with this, this example with Brian Winnick, Winsink, why it's so important. His research became instrumental in determining the USDA lunch program in the United States. So millions and millions and millions of children have had their dietary exposure at lunchtime altered because of this person's research. So this, the research that we talked about in class was how does plate size, how does atmosphere, how does 
eating with company affect the amount of food you consume? So these topics are extremely, extremely important that we talk about. So when we talk about academic misconduct and with the lessons we're trying to teach at universities, the only thing that you have as an academic is your reputation. And the minute that's tarnished, all the good research you may have done no longer matters. So any insights, Nick, into academic misconduct that you would like to share with the class? Oh, we might have froze. Oh, there we go. Have a look at, yeah, have a look at the, the, the endorsement on the front of the book there. Yeah, Oprah Magazine. So, so your thoughts, talk to us about academic misconduct. What is the severity, of, especially when you go into industry or academia, but a career beyond being a student, what would you want to say to them about academic misconduct? Um, personally, I think it's rather more pervasive than we would like to imagine. Um, the incentive structure of academia is set up to favor publishing rather than rigor uh, in terms of promotions, in terms of getting grant funding, um, uh, and you know, various various solutions have been proposed to this, most of which are eminently gameable, unfortunately. Um, I don't know what the, you know, nobody knows what the prevalence rate is of out and out fraud. I mean, fraud comes in different misconduct and fraud come in very, many many different forms. Um, until now, all we've been able really to sort of prove in a smoking gun kind of way. Uh, about Brian Monsing is that he was uh, doing a lot of what, well, what we call p hacking. Who know, hand up if you know the word p hacking. None. Okay. So, what? Uh, let, let's say that I I've told you that I can predict when dice will come up with a double six. And I've got this pair of dice, and I show you a picture of me rolling them, and they come up a double six. Uh, you've got a two point eight percent chance of rolling a double six on any pair of dice. So if I write an article that says, hey, I rolled some dice and they came up a double six, and that's only a 2.8% chance, we have a 5% threshold for statistical significance. That's notionally a publishable result. Now, there's kind of a difference between either I'm standing here with two dice live on air, and I'm going to go, right, guys, I'm going to throw these dice now, I'm going to go double six, and I do, and I get a double six. And that's okay, that's what it is. If it, if it turns out that what I did was I threw the dice 14 times and I stopped when I got the double six and I cut the other 13 out of the film, you're not quite as impressed by it. And, um, but you're, you're even less impressed if, you know, if after 20 I can't even get the double six, but I did have a double five. So then I write an article saying, you know, double fives are particularly prevalent in nature because I had three of those in the first 20. Um, and and this, is, this is a, a variant of p-hacking called harking. H-A-R-K, hypothesizing after the results are known. This goes on all the time in the social sciences. In fact, it probably, I would say the majority of papers published in social psychology in the last 25 years are the results of various flavors of inspecting the techniques, making up your hypothesis to fit the data, etc. Um, it's a huge problem. Now that isn't even considered misconduct. We would like to get to the point where that's considered misconduct. This is currently considered suboptimal, and we have a euphemism for it. We call it questionable research practices. Kind of, you know, in, in the same way that um, pickpocketing your pickpocketing your neighbour's phone is kind of considered a sort of questionable uh, inter-student relationship practice. Um, so we euphemise for that, but the, the, the major misconduct would be fabricating data or adjusting data, um, or, and then plagiarism is always included as the third of those. I, I think, I mean, plagiarism is wrong, but I think it's on a completely different dimension. Right. Um, and there's also self-plagiarism, for example, we do have Brian Monsing doing multiple times, uh, submitting the same chapter to two books. So, the one thing I wanted to point out to the class, the, the consequences of academic misconduct. We often 
think of it in our own little bubble. So we think of it on, for students typically as cheating, handing it in someone else's lab report. But who knows the company, and I'm going to probably butcher this, Theranos. Oh, yeah. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Well, Dean Expelman, he was dean, not just of psychology, he was dean of social sciences. He was the boss of the dean of psychology at the University of Tilburg in the Netherlands. And he uh, was caught in August of 20, end of August 2011, and it was basically determined he'd been fabricating data for years and just fabricated entire studies. He had an article in Science magazine about a study that never took place. It only took place in his head. Uh, he's got 58 retractions. Wow. Now, he did something extremely unusual for uh, somebody who commits academic misconduct, and particularly fraud, and that is he confessed. Uh, if you are ever accused of, of scientific misconduct, whatever you do, don't confess, because it's incredibly <laughs> hard to prove. So this was his, his major mistake. Now, during the year that the committee of inquiry took to uh, report into what he was doing, he wrote a book, which is... Have you got, have you got the screen? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So he wrote this book in Dutch, and I decided to translate it. I wrote him and said, you know, we, we, we thought we might even sell the English edition, but as it is, it became a free PDF uh, download. So this was his book, Old Sporting, which means derail them to we had to go off the rails although they're kind of more attracts than rails. And so I translated it, and when we decided not to publish it, I made it available as a free PDF download. So it's a full-length book. It's 8,000 words. Uh, but it's a pretty good, first of all, it's a pretty good introduction to social psychology, or rather social psychology as it was circa 2010. And if you, um, if you write that address down, and then, oh, whoops, whoops, okay, if you write that address down, download it, please don't print it off, put it on your Kindle, um, and there's, it, it's all about graphical, it's a beautifully written book, the translation does not do it justice, it's a beautifully written book, the guy can really write, he can, he's, got a, he's got a great imagination. <laughs> um, and yes, I love that here for my Twitter handle. It's for me. <laughs> and so does any, this is an excellent opportunity. This is exactly why we started using Twitter for this course, was to make these applications and these events possible. Does anybody have any questions for Nick? <laughs> yes? Can uh, Ryan Vincent legal consequences from what he did? Uh, that, uh, I'm afraid that Michael, uh, Michael sort of blocked most of the... <laughs> <laughs> I make a better door than window. So the question was, it, does, Brian, does Brian face any kind of legal ramifications for academic misconduct? I have no idea, but uh, it, it, it's amazing that this happened this week because uh, I just happened to, you know, I came across your tweets by chance because very occasionally I, I have to see what people are talking about on on about uh, Lansing on Twitter. Uh, that was um, Tuesday, and I said to Michael yesterday, I said, uh, one of the traits that psychologists study is thing called openness to experience. And within two hours of me making a somewhat snarky tweet about the content of this course, Michael was inviting me to come on and, and, and talk to you. And if that isn't openness to experience, I don't know what is. It does show the power of Twitter uh, for academic conversations, by the way. And you would never have thought it. If someone described you Twitter, you'd never think of that. So, uh, that was Tuesday. Yesterday, the six retractions dropped. We also learned that Cornell is preparing to come out with a report into the Committee of Inquiry that has been looking into this for six months. Uh, we don't even know if the words academic misconduct will be in there. Um, we've never made any kind of accusations. We've just been blogging and saying, look, this is wrong. Here is the very problem. They don't add up. <coughs> this result is not mathematically possible. And you know, we leave it to other people to fill in the gaps, and plenty of journalists and other people have been filling in the gaps. So we don't, we haven't used uh, we haven't used the F word for all. Um, so I don't know because um, uh, it's all been an internal inquiry by Cornell. Uh, I presume if they well maybe I, if they were a fire, I'd have thought we'd have heard before now. But I mean, they're reporting tomorrow, so this report is going to drop tomorrow. Uh, you might want to set yourself like a Google alert for Brian Weinstein. Um, you know, we don't know what, what went 
the embark. I, I don't even know if there's going to be a press release. I haven't been involved. Uh, and at no point in this entire process have Cornell contacted me or any of my fellow researchers to ask for clarification. Now, either we've been extraordinarily clear uh, in our communication, or they're trying to keep it a little bit under kind of control. Because this sort of thing is massively embarrassing uh, for a university. You know, they've had this guy, this guy has been on the front page of the business school's website for 10 years. Why you should come and study at Cornell, world leading researcher, here he is on Oprah, here he is on Good Morning America. Um, it's all, yeah, it's pretty embarrassing. And big bureaucratic organizations do not handle embarrassment well. That's very true. That's a life lesson for you. <laughs> Any other questions? No? With that, we, I would like to thank you very, very much. Well, you're most welcome. As I say, here is my... Uh, you do, uh, let me just pull up. So, uh, 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 uh. Here is my Twitter handle, but it's, it's, in the, it's in the tweet that Michael was showing the other day. Uh, feel free to follow me, and if you have any... Down in the bottom right hand corner there. Don't, don't ask... Don't ask where the name comes from, really. It's a long story. Um, and um, feel free to follow me. And if you have, you know, if any more well, if you have any follow up questions, if you think they're interested in the class, go to Michael and he can ask them. And if you've got an individual kind of little, hey, can you know, X, Y, Z, I'm, I'm retired. I have loads of time. <laughs> Thanks so much. Like I say, I had it in my dissertation, so I'm, yeah. <laughs> Waiting. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you so much for asking, Michael. And yet, just the proof of uh, the power of just just throwing things up in the air with that idea of tweeting about this, throwing things up in the air and seeing what happens. Just you, know, you make your own luck, and you can only do that by taking risks. All right. Thank you, sir. Bye.